One of the big accomplishments of Gene Parker's was, of course, to understand the nature of the sun's global magnetic field. But the sun is just an ordinary star. There are many other stars. And so we will hear today by Moira Jardine about the magnetic activity of the various other stars. Moira did her PhD in uh, 89 at the University of um, St. Andrews. Uh, had then postdoctoral positions at the University of uh, Sussex, uh, then moved back to St. Andrews, where she is now professor of uh, uh, astro astronomy, and uh, she is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So with that, uh, Moira, please uh, take it away on stellar magnetic fields. <coughs> So I'd, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be here. It's a great pleasure. Now, although my title is actually very short, it's really quite a broad subject. And so I decided to split it into just two of the aspects where Jean Parker's work has had its most impact. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the hot corona of the sun, oops, and its structure here, which we see beautifully outlined in this eclipse picture. And we heard this morning about how that gas is heated. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the this winds from stars. And of course, Jean Parker's early paper on the solar wind, which is coming out in these places, is fundamental to this subject. Now, I've shown you an image taken at one moment in an eclipse of the sun. But of course, we know that the, the sun changes through its magnetic cycle. So what I'm showing you here is a composite image. So on the bottom here, we have the, the number of sunspots over time. So this is the minimum of the cycle when there were few spots, and the maximum here. And up above, there are two composite images. This one is taken at the minimum of the cycle. So you've got an X-ray image of the sun showing all the bright emission close to the equator where the spots are. And it's overlaid with contours of the wind speed. So we see the very fast wind coming out of the polar regions and the slower wind coming out at the equator. If we run forward in time to the maximum of the cycle, we see the picture looks rather different. The, the hot and, uh, emission from the, the corona is now distributed over a larger area, and we see both fast and slow wind streams at a hugely greater range of latitudes. So we see the sun looking both like a fairly inactive star and like quite an active star, just over the course of, of 11 years. Now, we expect that over the whole of its lifetime, this structure will have changed as well. The reason that we expect this is that, as we learned from Jean Parker, the, the sun has a wind, and that wind carries away not just mass, but it carries away angular momentum. And that means that the, the star, or the sun, slows down its rotation over time. Now, we, we can take a very, very simple model of this. So we can have a, a star with a spherically symmetric isothermal wind, sort of nice, simple model that all theorists like. And we can write down the rate at which that wind is carrying away angular momentum. And what we find, after a little bit of fancy mathematical footwork, is that the, the rate of loss of angular momentum is proportional to omega, which is the rate at which the star is spinning, and the magnetic flux that passes through uh, a spherical surface. So the faster a star spins, the larger is omega, and the faster it's losing angular momentum. The faster it spins, the faster it spins down. But There's, there's a hidden problem here in this expression, and it's hidden inside this term, the magnetic field strength at the surface. Because we expect that the strength of the magnetic field varies with the rotation rate of a star. The magnetic field is generated by a dynamo, powered by rotation. The faster the star spins, probably it's producing more magnetic field. So we can make a simple approximation. We can say, let's assume that we have what's called a linear dynamo law, the magnetic field strength just increases with omega as the, the rotation rate of the star. We can then integrate that equation. And what we find as the solution, if the moment of inertia of the star is constant, is that the rotation rate omega varies with time as t to the minus a half. 
As time goes by, as T gets larger, omega gets smaller. The star's spin rate slows down. And this is exactly what we believe is driving the drop in magnetic activity that the Sun would have experienced as it aged. So this is a very powerful concept because it means if we know the rotation rate of a star, omega, we can infer the time, we can infer how old the star is. And that's something that's really difficult to determine by other methods. So this is the, the field, it's called gyrochronology, measuring ages by how fast something spins. Now, I've put up here one of the first uh, sets of observations of this process. Now, this paper goes back to 1972. In many ways, this is a terrible plot. When my students produced this plot, I'd give them a D minus. You know, you look at it and you think, well, here's the time axis in giga years. It's actually quite hard to read. And here's this axis. There's not even a label on this axis. The reason there's not a label is that three different things are plotted, these three curves. This is the interesting one for us, the rotation rate of the star. Now, the eagle-eyed among you might notice that there are only one, two, three data points on this graph. And that's why this is a wonderful plot, because on the basis of three observations, Andy Skomanich was able to infer that as stars get older, their spin rates slow down. Now, I put this plot in because I reckoned Gene Parker, if you were here, would have something to say about this plot. Because after all, his original paper on the solar wind almost didn't get past the referee, because as the referee said, the first referee, well, there are no observations of this phenomenon, therefore it doesn't exist. Now, this paper here managed to start off the gyrochronology field on the basis of three data points. And I think perhaps we can all agree that perhaps that's three data points more than you really need. But, you know, that's, that's a long time ago. The, the science has moved on. Let's fast forward a little bit in time. We'll go past now to 2003, a good 30 years later. It took a long time for observations of enough rotation rates of stars to become available for gyrochronology really to get established. And so what people did, they went out and they looked at clusters of stars which were of different ages. And as they looked from young clusters to old clusters, they expected to see the rotation rates changing. And that's indeed what was found. So this is a composite of many observations. Each panel is a different cluster, therefore a different age. And what you're seeing is the rotation period of the stars in the cluster, and this is a, a color to separate the stars out. As we go to older clusters, you see the distribution of points is changing. Each point is a different star. And this is because the rotation rates of the stars are evolving. They're all slowing down, and eventually they all bunch up in a sort of traffic jam here. Now, this paper is actually a theoretical paper, and it presented the idea that stars exist on these two sequences, this line here and this line here and that those sequences represent two different types of internal structure. You have the convective sequence, this lower one, where stars are fully convective in their interiors. The other branch is called the in interface branch, where stars have formed a radiative core, and there's an interface between the radiative core and the outer convective zone. And the idea of this paper was that as the internal structure of the star changes, so you might expect the rotation rates to change because the magnetic field which is causing the loss of angular momentum is generated by a dynamo which is seated in the interior of the star. Well, let's move forward a little bit in time. We now live in the age of big data. We have many, many more observations. I've only picked one here. I could have picked many. Um, I have a list of many of the other papers at the bottom. This is a similar plot. It's a uh, rotation rate on this axis, so slow stars are at the top against another color. The colors of the individual data points are telling you about um, the different ages of the clusters. But you see a similar behavior of stars all forming this traffic jam at the top end as they've all spun down. 
We can bring lots of different types of observations to bear on this problem. So we have Kepler to give us light curves, we have Gaia to give us parallaxes. And this has revealed a strange puzzle about stellar spin down. It appears that, certainly for M dwarfs, it's very small stars, that their spin down stalls as they get old. It seems that the, the, the spin down runs out of juice at late ages. We don't really know why. We also have the different tool of astroseismology to confirm the ages of these stars. And this also suggests that, and here's a bit of technical jargon, I apologize for this, for large Rossby numbers, you can think of that as being slowly rotating older stars, magnetic breaking gets a bit weak. So, so this leaves me with, with one of the, the questions that we still would like an answer to, is how active are old stars? I look at these gentlemen and I think they're probably pretty active in their mature years, but we don't know about, we don't know about stars. Do they remain active? Do they spin down just as fast when they're old? So this is, this is a problem that, that we're currently working on. So to answer these questions, we really need to, to understand what different factors affect the, the torques in the wind. And the torques are what cause the, the, the loss of angular momentum. So I'm showing here, this is a, a big MHD simulation from Eleni Vidotto. What you're looking at are the field lines are in grey. So these, these little loops here would be what you see bright in X-ray images. That's the hot corona that we heard about this morning. Uh, but that hot corona is pushing the magnetic field outwards, and that's what you see is these long straight lines. That's where the wind is escaping. So we'd like to understand some of the, the fundamental ingredients of physics that go into determining these wind torques. And this is where the data that's coming out of Parker Solar Probe is going to make such a difference in the, the stellar field. So here we have um, some of the, the results from the Parker Solar Probe. One of the main factors that goes into models of stellar angular momentum loss is the, the size of the closed corona, which is another proxy for the open magnetic flux. And here we see uh, two different images of this. So the the boundary, if you like, of the corona is this, this dark blue line, and the, the black line is the, the disk of the sun. And these are two different observations taken at two different times. The takeaway here is that the shape of the sun's corona changes with time, and it's not spherically symmetric. You know, life is so unfair to theorists. You know, it has to be complicated. So this information about the, the extent of the sun's closed corona and how it evolves with time is, is one of the main inputs to our models of angular momentum loss. The other thing that we need to understand, if we're going to understand how stars spin down with time, is how the corona is structured. And there's a, a little cartoon here. Um, the, the opening up, the rate at which the field opens up with radius is one of the factors that accelerates the flow, that accelerates the, the, s the stellar wind. And that depends on the shape of the field. Now, it's always true in tackling a difficult problem that it always bites back. And we know that this is one of the things that's important, but it's very difficult to determine for other stars. We don't resolve other stars. So this is one of, the, one of the areas where the information that's coming out of, of uh, spacecraft like the Parker Solar Probe is going to be so useful. We, we, ex we expect that the structure will vary with the mass of the star and that, that it will vary with age. But this, uh, this is something that we're looking into. Stellar winds are, you know, they're, they're sneaky, they're difficult to observe, but one of the the things that is becoming more and more apparent is that the, the rate of mass loss, which is what's plotted here on the, this axis, the rate of mass loss per unit surface area, appears to scale with the X-ray flux on this axis. Now, each of those points is a, a star that's been observed. 
and the lines are results of different theoretical predictions. Now, at which point all the theorists wipe their brows and say, thank goodness, because the lines go through the data points. Um, how often does that happen? What it suggests is that when stars are very X-ray bright, which is when they're magnetically very active, like the sun at the maximum of its cycle, so when they're out here, they correspondingly produce a wind that is, is losing more mass per unit surface area. So stars that have got very bright X-ray coronae probably have very powerful winds. So the sun today is down here. It's one of the data points. It's there, in fact. When it was younger, it was probably up here somewhere. Now, direct measurements of, of stellar winds are very difficult to come by. It's usually done in the radio. Often, it's only upper limits you can get. The points that I'm showing you here are more direct measurements. They're done by a variety of methods. Uh, the different colors of the points tell you the different methods that were used. I'm not going to go into the details. Suffice to say that the different methods appear to agree. Uh, so we have, some, we have some belief that young active stars have winds that are more powerful than the wind of the, the sun today. So if we, um, if we think of, of where we're at today, what, is the, what are some of the, the most exciting things that are happening in, in this field? I would say that one of the, um, one of the areas that, that's receiving a lot of attention at the moment is linking together, not just modeling the winds from stars, but also the interior structure. The, the dynamo that is generating the magnetic field that's causing this loss of angular momentum. And this, this coupling you can see here, uh, this is a paper from Rui Pinto. So this is a model of the uh, section of the interior of the star, the convective zone, and the magnetic field that's been generated. So the, the dotted lines are the poloidal field lines and the color is the toroidal field. So that's a model for what's happening in the interior of the star, and on the right is the model for the, the resulting wind. And these authors looked at how this changed through the, the sun's magnetic cycle. This is a, a solar type solution. So we're now at a stage when we can try to understand not just separately how the dynamo generates a magnetic field, but how that might impact upon or be affected by the, the wind that is being lost. Now, I, I'm a theorist, um, so I always feel the, the tight constraint of observations, sometimes far too tight, of course. So if, if we have a, a model like this, we always should ask ourselves, how do, we, how do we test this model? So we would like to have, if we, if we look at this image here, it predicts the, the distribution of magnetic field at the surface of the star, and we'd like to be able to image that. Of course, we can't directly image stars, we, but we can use indirect methods. So these are some indirect reconstructions of what the surface radial magnetic field of other stars might look like based on observations. Uh, what you're seeing here is that the radial field is colored, depending whether it's coming towards you or going away from you, and the scale goes from Oh, some tens of gauss to some thousands of gauss. The details don't matter for the purposes of this talk. I just wanted to demonstrate to you that stars come in all shapes and sizes, and so do their magnetic fields. You see very different types of distribution of magnetic field. And this is a huge challenge, of course, for, for dynamo theory. But I just told you that we can't resolve the surfaces of these stars. They're much too small, they're much too far away. So how do, we, how do we produce maps like this of their surfaces? Well, we put together two different pieces of physics. We put together what we understand about the Zeeman effect. So we know that the Zeeman effect splits light into different polarized components. So a line that was single here will be split into different components. And the polarization that you see depends on the orientation of the field. So what you see when the field is um, 
in the plane of the sky for you is quite different to what you see if the magnetic field is pointing towards you. So depending on the, the orientation of the field, you see a different polarization. But stars don't, don't just sit there. They, they typically rotate. So as the star rotates, you see a different view of the star. It's a bit like having an MRI and, and, and being rotated inside it. So if we think of this orientation here, we have a field that's in the plane of the sky, but as the star rotates, that field changes to be coming towards us, and here it is in the plane of the sky again. So we use the fact that as the star rotates, we see the magnetic field from different perspectives, and that changes the polarization. And we put those two pieces of information together. So here I have a, a little animation of how this works. On the left-hand side, you see a little patch of radial field on the surface of the star. And on the right-hand side, it's a patch of horizontal field. And underneath is the changing um, polarization signature that we see. So for the experts in the audience, it's the Stokes V signature that I'm showing here. For everyone else, the important thing to notice is that the two different geometries of the field give you different signatures, and those signatures change with time. So by observing the star as it rotates, we can do the inverse problem and infer what the structure of the field could have been at the surface. <coughs> so what do, we use <coughs> what do we use this for? So I have, I have two different um, examples that I would like to, to show you. So I'm going to look at the role of the interior structure of the star in two different ways. But before I show you what, you f what we find, I wanted to th think about what we expect to find. <coughs> so here is uh, an HR diagram for the experts. It's luminosity against temperature. And I'm showing here the track that a young star takes in this parameter plane as it evolves. So when it first forms, it collapses out of its molecular cloud. It's sitting up here. At this point, the interior is fully convective. A star like the Sun would then evolve downwards in this plane until its, its, its core becomes stable against convection. Its internal structure changes with time. And it, at this point, it forms a, a radiative core. So there's no longer convection in the core. So it goes off this Hayashi track onto the Henyi track. And now we have an interface between the radiatively stable core and the outer convective zone. So the internal structure has changed. Now, given that the dynamo exists somewhere within this interior, the change of the internal structure might reasonably be expected to change the way the dynamo operates. So we might expect, if we look at stars that are very, very young and perhaps a little older, and maybe even once they're down here, they're stable, they've ignited hydrogen in their cores, maybe we would see different types of magnetic field. So that's the hypothesis. <coughs> and of course, we all know that no hypothesis survives being confronted with data. However, in this case, of course, I wouldn't be showing it to you if it didn't work. <coughs> Here's what we actually observe. This is essentially the same plot, luminosity against temperature. These dashed lines are those evolutionary tracks that I showed you one of before. And each of these points is a star whose surface magnetic field has been mapped. So if you, if you look at this evolutionary track here, uh, you see that there appear to be changes in those symbols. And those changes are reflected in three different ways. You notice the symbols get smaller, and the size of the symbol is telling us about the strength of the magnetic field. So when stars were, were very young, when they were fully convective, they were generating strong magnetic fields. And then once the radiative core formed, it seemed the magnetic field got weaker. The other thing you notice is the color of the symbols. And that's telling us about um, whether the, the, the field is mainly poloidal or toroidal. A detail for the experts, but the color changes, become much more toroidal down here. 
And you notice that the shape of the symbol changes. They go from being almost round up here to being more star-like down here. And that change in shape is telling us about the, the change of the degree of axis symmetry of the fields. So they're very symmetric when they're fully convective and quite non-axis symmetric when, they're, um, when they've got a radiative core. Now, it, what we're seeing here is the change of the internal structure in the, of the star being reflected in the structure of the magnetic field that's produced. We also see a change in the X-ray emission from its corona, that hot emission we heard about this morning. It becomes much more highly modulated as the star rotates, which suggests the field is becoming more complex. So let me show you a few examples. I've, I've talked in, in generalities about uh, what we see uh, in these stars as observed. I'm going to pick out two different examples to show you. So here's, here's one system. It's actually a binary system. It has a white dwarf and a, a K2 dwarf. So here's the exactly the same plot again, luminosity against temperature, evolutionary tracks. Here are the two components of this binary system here. These are reasonably old stars, about 600 million years. It's uh, a lot younger than the sun at 4,500 million years, but, but still a lot, lot older than the very fully convective stars I was showing you earlier. So what do we see when we look at the surfaces of these stars? Binary systems are very good ones to look at because we get a lot of extra information from the fact that it's a binary. So here I'm showing you some, some real data. Uh, so these, this is the data here and this is the model that was fitted to it. So this is essentially a rotation phase on this axis, or time. So time is moving upwards, and this is the velocity of the line. The important thing is that you see signatures moving through the, the lines, and those are the signatures of uh, surface inhomogeneities, dark and, and warm spots on the surface. What you're seeing on the right here is the reconstructed image. Now, there's a technical term for this projection. It's called a squashed hedgehog. <laughs> you're, it's as if you were looking down on the pole of the star. This dark solid line is the, the edge of the star, the limb of the star. The dashed lines are 30 degree latitude intervals. So you can, you, here's minus 30 degrees latitude here. And the tick marks tell you all the different rotation phases of which observations were made. So they demonstrate this is a really well-observed system. So what you see is, is cool, cool regions, cool dark spots at the pole, and brighter regions at the equator. This is something you don't see on the sun. The sun doesn't form dark spots at its pole. So these stars are doing something that the sun doesn't do. This system has been observed several times, so we can look at variations from year to year, and that's, that's something that's also very instructive for us. So here's a, um, an extrapolation of what the magnetic field might look like. The dark lines are the, the closed lines that would confine the hot gas of the corona, and the yellow lines are the field lines along which the, the stellar wind is escaping. So we can learn about the, potentially about the structure of the, the corona. We can also learn that uh, not only does the field structure change with time, but apparently so does the surface differential rotation. The differential rotation at the surface is the difference between the rate of rotation at high latitudes, say at the pole, and at lower latitudes, say at the equator. So that's that difference plotted here, d omega against the equatorial value. And it shows that at different times when the star was observed, that difference in rotation rates changed. And that is, that is interesting all by itself. It's been seen on one other star, which the other star is AB Dor, with these light purple points. So it, it appears that over time, and these that we're talking years here, the, the differential rotation, which is you know, one of the, the fundamental bits of physics uh, of the, 
the surface and interior of the star evolves over time. There's a, there's a great paper about um, stars doing the twist, uh, thinking of the, the rotation rate changing. We also see um, cool clouds called prominences trapped in the corona of many active stars, and these were very well observed on this system. This little point here says white dwarf, so that's the, the, the white dwarf um, component of the binary. And we saw the white dwarf um, as it goes in front and behind of this star. So here's my, my other example, V530 pair. It's one of the, the alpha pair um, stars. It's much younger, 33 million years. So I've gone back in time a little bit. Uh, here's the same plot again, luminosity against temperature, evolutionary tracks, and here are some different realizations of the location of this star. You see it's, it's not quite on the main sequence yet, it's still quite young. This is an image of the, the radial magnetic field at the surface. You see it's very complicated looking. Uh, but what I really wanted to show you, because this is something that's very close to my heart, are the observations of the prominences. So this is the data on the left. This again is time running this way, or rotation phase against velocity. These dark features that you see moving through the line are the, the observational signature of these cool clouds coming in front of the star and blocking out some of the light. So they transit in front of the star. These were taken about a week apart. This other projection is, is much easier to, to, to understand. It's essentially what you would see if you stood above the rotation pole of the star and looked down. So this is the disk of the star here, and you see all these dark absorbing clouds around the star. And you see over a time scale of a week, they're still there, but they've, they've evolved a little bit. So this is crucial information that's telling us about the dynamics of, of stellar coronae. You notice that they all cluster around this dashed line here uh, in both epochs. And this is very common for observations of these features. They're, they're typically found around this radius, which is called the co-rotation radius. And it's, it's the radius at which the inward pull of gravity is, is just balanced by the outward centrifugal force. So it's a very natural place for material to collect in. So these, these cool clouds, these stellar prominences, outline the this, this structure of the star's magnetic field, a bit like the iron filings. Um, so they're, they're a way that we can probe this, this structure that's otherwise hard to see. So what's the, the second example I was going to give you of the role of interior structure? So it's, I'm showing you a different type of diagram now. It's also got a technical name. It's called the confusogram because it's, it's a five-dimensional plot. So you have to put your, your five-dimensional glasses on to, to understand this one. So this, this axis is mass in units of the mass of the sun. So it's all the way down to a tenth of a solar mass, up to 0.8. And this axis is, is a strange parameter called the Rossby number, but it's a proxy for rotation rate. So as you go to the right, the rotation rate is getting lower. So you can think of the arrow of time for all these stars would be, be pointing to the right. As all these stars get older, they would move to the right in this plot. Now, you notice that these symbols again look quite different. So down here, we've got the red, almost circular symbols. These are the fully convective stars, just like the, the ones I showed you before. And these stars probably have a, a radiative core. But they're all, on the, they're all um, established stars. They're what we would say is on the main sequence. They're burning hydrogen in their cores. It appears that even for mature stars, as you look towards lower masses and you go to an internal structure, which is fully convective, the types of magnetic field that, that are generated are different. But once again, there's a, there's, there's a surprise in doing this. Well, the first surprise was this change at the fully convective boundary. The second surprise was down in this region of parameter space down here, because there are always some stars that just don't want to go with the trend. And these stars down here, they're just like that. Some of them 
have got these big, strong, axisymmetric, uh, almost dipolar fields. And some of them, these little symbols, have got very weak, very complicated fields. But they both reside in the same part of parameter space, the same mass, the same rotation rate. And we don't really entirely understand why there's a difference between them. There are many theories at the moment, but this is uh, these little low mass, fast rotating stars are, are a great puzzle and well worth continuing to look at. OK, so I've, I've talked a lot uh, about the role of the interior of the star. So I just wanted to, to say a little bit about uh, some of the recent uh, exciting things that are, are happening in modeling the interiors of stars. So again, this is, this is a fast moving and, and very um, active field. There are many different models that I could have, have shown you, and I've only picked one. I just picked a recent one. So this is a model of solar type stars. So by that we mean stars about the same mass as the sun. And what you're looking at are models at three different times over a time scale of about 10 years. This is the, the structure of the field with the, the field lines extrapolated. Uh, this is B5, the azimuthal field, and BR, the radial field. So in this example, you see that over a time scale of about 10 years, the, the field structure has changed. So it looks as if you're, you've got a star that's got a magnetic cycle, sort of like the sun. But this study looked at stars at a whole, of a whole range of rotation rates, which is parameterized by this Rossby number, this, this number here. So for very small Rossby numbers, for rapidly rotating stars, long cycles were produced. For um, slightly, slightly larger Rossby numbers, rotating a bit more slowly, we've got short cycles, perhaps a little bit more like the sun. Uh, for much larger Rossby numbers, something odd happened. So differential rotation became different in sign to what it is on the sun. On the sun, the equator rotates faster than the poles. But on these stars that have spun down, so the rotation rates are very slow, the opposite appears to have happened. Um, so the, the pole is rotating faster than the equator. And indeed, the cycles appeared to disappear. There was just a steady state. These stars, these old are the old stars that I showed you this picture of the old gentleman um, on the racetrack. They're the old stars that were behaving strangely, that seemed to have a, their their spin down appear to have fizzled out. So maybe, maybe the answer to why this happens lies in how the dynamo is operating. So I just have one more example to show you, because um, I talked about the very low mass stars, the M dwarfs. And this is uh, an example of some uh, simulations of the interiors of, of very low mass stars. So what you see in the bottom, I think they're separated by only, only a few days, I think, in the simulation. You see these clusters of very vigorous convection here. It's localized, so we appear to be um, generating structure in azimuth. And here are some images of the, the rise of a magnetic flux tube. Uh, I think if Gene Parker were here, he would really enjoy seeing this, having worked so much on the buoyant rise of flux tubes. So we see a flux tube rising towards the surface as time progresses. So I'm getting very close to the end of my time. I just have uh, one final very brief topic that uh, I wanted to touch upon. So I've, I've talked about the results of modeling the interiors of stars, the modeling the dynamos. I've talked about the, the winds and how they remove angular momentum. There is another. Um, there's another aspect to the structure of stellar coronae that I haven't touched upon, and that's the, the concept of magnetic helicity. So helicity is a, a measure of how linked magnetic fields are, or indeed any, any fields. And I've drawn a little simple cartoon of a, a blue field line and a red field line that are linked like this. So helicity is a, a measure of how much flux is linked within a field. 
So we've got its, its mathematical definition here. What's important about helicity is that it's a conserved quantity. It's like mass or electric charge. It's, it's conserved. So it's one of the things that uh, you would track if you were modeling the generation of a magnetic field. Have I conserved helicity? It's really difficult to measure observationally, uh, largely because this is a volume integral. And we don't measure the magnetic field, certainly of stars, within the entire coronal volume. We only measure the magnetic fields at the surface. So we can't really get a, a full handle on the helicity within the corona. But we can calculate this thing, the integrand here, which is called the helicity density. That's something we can map across stellar surfaces. And we find something really strange when we do this. So here's a plot of uh, this helicity density on this axis uh, against essentially the strength of the toroidal field. Uh, so you can think of the toroidal field in this little simple cartoon as being the blue field lines here, the ones that wrap around the star. So each point on this plot is a different star. And the shapes are telling you about what sort of star you're looking at. So the, the diamonds are the very low mass stars. They're likely to be fully convective. They're up here. So the color here is stellar mass. And the circles are stars whose mass is greater than about half a solar mass. These are more solar-like. They've got a radiative core. And they tend to be down here. And the sun is here. And we have the sun just at a few sample points through its magnetic cycle. Now, this, this plot covers eight orders of magnitude on this axis, and it's a beautiful straight line. I mean, we all love a beautiful straight line correlation. All these stars are behaving in the same way, even though their internal structure is quite different. They're all lying on the same line, and the scatter about the line is consistent with what we see on the sun through its magnetic cycle. The sun is perfectly consistent with all these other stars. At which point you think, well, I'm finished, I'm done, I've got a straight line correlation, I can, I can fit to it, it uh, agrees with what I see in the sun, isn't it wonderful? And then you think to yourself, hmm, well, I only plotted this helicity density against one component of the magnetic field. What if I tried the other component? At which point... It, all goes to pieces, of course, because that one single line resolves itself into two. And those two lines are beautifully delineated by the internal structure of the star. So this line here is all these um, the lowest mass stars who are fully convective. And this line here is the star, are the stars that are more like the sun with the radiative core. The, the color here now is the Rossby number, this proxy for rotation rate, and increases as you go up this branch and as you go down this branch. So what's happening here? Well, it seems that these, these low mass stars, these ones here, are discrepant in some way. The, if you, you know, take two that have the same helicity, they're on a line here, the low mass stars have got a lot more colloidal magnetic field, they've got a lot more magnetic energy for the same helicity. So that suggests they're not very good at generating helicity. Now, for the experts in the audience, I should qualify what I'm saying in saying that because we only measure the large scale fields of stars, this is only the helicity on the largest scales. But it seems as if these, these very low mass stars produce lots of energy. They're a way out on this axis. They've got strong magnetic fields that are very energetic. But for the amount of energy they've got, they're not producing much helicity. In fact, we could have an efficiency factor that we could plot. Let's do that. Let's plot the efficiency with which stars produce helicity. We'll take the helicity density and divide it by the energy density. So here are the low mass stars here. They've got a very low number because they're not very efficient. And here are the stars like the sun. And the lines join 
multiple observations of the same star. And the sun would be here, of course, at one solar mass. It would, it would go up and down through its cycle by about this amount. So stars like the sun are efficient at producing helicity, and low mass stars aren't, and we don't know why. It's, it's a puzzle. So I'm on my final slide just before the chairman throws me off. Uh, we've learned that the evolution of stellar magnetic fields depends on the dynamo and the wind. There are plenty of current puzzles to keep us occupied. What about the old stars when the rotation rate slows down? What, what happens to them? What about their angular momentum loss? And what about the very low mass stars, the M dwarfs? How does their activity evolve? Plenty to keep us going. And I haven't even touched upon the last of my points, which is what impact does this have on exoplanetary environments? Stars and planets evolve together like a family. And if the star changes over time as it evolves, its impact on the planets forming around it will also change. And that's, that's a very active field that would be at least one more symposium to go into. So I'm going to stop at this point, and I'll take questions. Thank you. Yes.